Okay, hello. Um, this is the wrong notes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Talk about common use of toast instead of Hume. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, um, so there's a bunch of stuff I didn't get to last time, but I'm not going to go back to most of it. Um, but I did want to talk briefly about what Hume says about the materiality of the soul um, in section five of part four. Um, and this is on page 298 in the Penguin edition. Um, because it's it's funny. It also raises some problems, but I'm not gonna get into that problems, but um, uh, oh, one sixteen. To pronounce then the final decision upon the whole, this is a summary at the end of the section. The question concerning the substance of the soul is absolutely unintelligible. <laughs> right? So if you if when you ask about the materiality of the soul, if you mean is the soul a material or an immaterial substance? He says it's absolutely unintelligible. And it's unintelligible because substance is unintelligible, right? Okay, so fine. Um, then the next conclusion is, all our perceptions are not susceptible of a local union, either with what is extended or unextended. There being some of them of the one kind and some of the other, right? So if what you mean when you ask whether the soul is material or not, is whether the soul can be in the same place with a extended thing, that, right? Whether it's susceptible of a local union with what is extended, then the answer is, well, some of our perceptions are susceptible of a local union with what is extended and some are not. Okay, so like, uh, So like, I mean, remember how, and now we're back to basically something like the, the philosophical view, only without the primary secondary distinction, I guess, just like he had in book two, you know, so like our perceptions. So suppose I have a perception of something that's white and round and extended. Well, then um, that, that means I have an impression that's white and rounded extended. So my impression is white and round and extended. It resembles this thing that's white and round and extended. I mean, this brings up the, the problem someone raised before about, because a snowball is a perfect example of something where if you look at the pieces closely, they're not white. Um, but anyway, forgetting about that. So like, so this impression has a size and shape. So it's susceptible of a local union with something that's extended. It could be in the same place. But for example, it could be in the same place as the snowball. I mean, it's actually much smaller than the snowball. So it wouldn't take up most of the space. The snowball has millions of parts. This has only a few. But um, but it, it could be in part of a snowball. <laughs> but on the other hand, he says, you know, some of our other impressions, like impressions of taste, pain. Yeah, I mean, it's weird how much it's weird to me how Hume and many of the people who come after Hume seem to take this as obvious. That an impression of taste, for example, has no place. Um, I mean, aren't they in your mouth? <laughs> can't you like feel them spreading sometimes? <laughs> right? I I don't know, but and pain, that's even weirder. I mean, it's a matter of size and I, I don't know. Anyway. But so these other impressions and passions and whatever he says are like don't have a the 
the impression doesn't have a size and shape, and therefore it couldn't be in the same place as an extended form. And so, like, if you wanted to decide whether the soul was material or immaterial, if what you meant by that is what is the substance of the soul, it's unintelligible. What you meant by that is could the soul be in the same place as a body? And the answer is, well, part of it could, and the other part could. <laughs> and it turns out to be not very interesting. <laughs> so, um, and then the final part is. Um, Um, and as the constant conjunction of objects constitutes the very essence of cause and effect, matter and motion may often be regarded as the causes of thought, as far as we have any notion of that relation. Right? So he's stressing, so, so like a further topic connected to the materiality of the soul is like, um, can the soul exert a force on the body or vice versa? Right? Can, we, can a change in a body cause a change in a soul or vice versa? And um, so, like in the rationalist, on the rationalist side, there's a big deal made about the fact that it, that the king as a body, you know, only acts by impulse and so forth. And um, so, Hume's response is. Um, that there's no such thing as rationalist causation, right? The rest so of the rationalists are thinking that a body can only act by impulse because like for something to be the cause of something else means to understand the effect by means of the cause, right? Like to see how the effect follows logically from the cause. <laughs> and Hume is saying like, we never see that. So the soul can act on the body in the same way that bodies can act on bodies, namely, not really at all. <laughs> I mean, namely, which is the constant conjunction that causes the habit and whatever. Yeah. By by saying this like the, the substance of the soul is unintelligible, I was a little confused if he meant like the very like idea of asking that is just like like unintelligible or if the substance of the soul, like the actual substance, is what is unintelligible. No, he says, I mean, uh, like I might have said it in a sloppy way, but I think he says it correctly. The question concerning the substance of the soul is absolutely okay. unintelligible. Okay. He doesn't mean there is so much of substance that is mysterious and unintelligible. Yeah. He means there's no there's no question there, so I'm not going to answer this. Right. Um, okay, are there questions about that or about any of the things I talked about last time? Okay, it's, uh, if not, I'm going to go on to the new material. So, right, so the new. So the new. Uh, I mean, there's two new sections, right? One is on personal identity. And the other is the conclusion of this book. That is the conclusion of book one of the treatise. And um, leading into the beginning of book two, um, so I really hope I have time to talk about both. Um, I have to be careful not to let, um, not to let this section take over and have to rush through this one, which is what practically always happens. <laughs> anyway, we'll see. So, um, all right, so personal identity. So it starts with this. This is on page 299. Um, there are some philosophers who imagine 
we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call ourself. That we feel its existence and its continuance in existence and are certain beyond the evidence of a demonstration, both of its perfect identity and simplicity. So which philosophers are these? You notice the editors of my edition actually going to put it on the back. But I'm not going to believe what they say. No, you know, I shouldn't do that. All right. So which philosophy are you trying to So, uh, um, well, it's not Locke. Ray, I mean, Locke does they say we have an intuitive knowledge of our own existence. And I discussed a little bit what he could possibly mean by that. I mean, it has to mean somehow that we, we immediately perceive a kind of agreement between the idea of existence. Hume thinks there is no such idea as the idea of existence, right? But Locke thinks there is. There's some kind of, we immediately perceive some kind of agreement between the idea of existence and the idea of ourselves. That's what uh, um, Locke has to mean by that. But as for perfect identity and simplicity, he doesn't maintain that at all, let alone that we know it. Intuitive. Um, so he might mean Descartes, although um, I'm not at all sure that would be accurate. At least not the same way Hume thinks about him thinks about it. Um, so like. When Descartes says in the second meditation, like, is it not the same eye who thinks and remembers and blah, blah, blah? Um, I, you know, it is supposed to be certain beyond the evidence of demonstration that the answer is yes, but not, I think, because we feel it, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, Descartes not an empiricist. <laughs> it's not because we feel it. Um, it's because we attempt to doubt it lands us in a contradiction, right? So it's like, um, never, I mean, nevertheless, it's possible that Hume doesn't interpret Descartes that way. I guess Husserl interprets Descartes that way. Um, but um, that, that Descartes somehow at that point in the second meditation, that somehow the outcome of the cognitive argument is, I see something that is myself. And I'm certain that it exists, right? I perceive it by kind of internal perception. But I don't think Descartes is saying that at all. He's saying, I can't doubt it without contradicting myself. It's something quite different. Um, so uh, it's like a logical point. Um, so, um, um, which, by the way, I guess Hume ultimately is going to agree that the attempt to doubt this lands you in a contradiction. That's what he says in the appendix. <laughs> um, but uh, um, so that would actually bring her bring him closer to what I think Descartes actually means. But so um, so it could be he's thinking about Descartes. Um, it's certainly not Barclay, right? Like Barclay does think that we um, can be certain that there's a simple uh, and continuing and perfectly identical subject of all our ideas. But he doesn't think that we do that by having an idea of it. Right? So, um, Um, so Hume's whole argument here wouldn't apply to him. Hume's whole argument is where did we get this idea? What impression did it come from, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, so, um, so I don't know who he's thinking of when he says some philosophers, there are some philosophers who imagine this. It's, you know, again, it's possible that he interprets Descartes this way or even that he interprets Locke this way. I don't know. Uh, it's also possible that he's kind of uh, inventing a version of this view that seems to him somewhat intelligible so that he can engage with it. 
I mean, I think this is something that philosophers often do when they relate to the history of philosophy. They'll interpret their predecessor in a somewhat unfair way, but the reason they're doing it is not because they're like bad interpreters, but because what their predecessor thinks they mean is like, according to the later person, is just not something you can meet. It's just not, right? So they also like, rather than trying to engage with that supposed opinion, which they think is not an opinion at all, they'll like instead engage with kind of the closest opinion to it that makes any sense to them. And I, that may also be what's going on here with Hume, right? Is that like Hume is thinking, well, what could it in any sensible way mean to say that I'm intuitively certain of my own existence? It could only mean that I have like an idea of myself based on an impression that's constantly existing and whatever. Um, so, um, right, so he proves from he proves from that, well, he proves from experience that we have no such consciousness. Right, it starts, unluckily, all these positive assertions are contrary, it's still on page 299. Unluckily, all these positive assertions are contrary to that very experience which is pleaded for them nor have we any idea of self after the manner it is here explained. Right, so like they claim that we know something intuitive about ourself, but he's saying we have no such idea as what they're talking about. And how can we, how can we be sure we have no such idea? Well, like we apply the test that every idea is a copy of some impression. So if we have this idea, we must have the impression. Like something a little confusing about this, because it seems like he starts off talking about these philosophers thinking we have the impression. Um, so why go by way of the idea? To say we don't have that impression. But I guess point is he's trying to, to prove something stronger. Not only don't we have that impression, we don't have an idea of such a self. But from what impression could the idea be derived? I mean, suppose there were an exception to the rule that we never have an idea that's not derived from an impression. Um, because remember, he said before, if you think this rule isn't valid, it's easy, just produce the exception. So suppose there might be an exception. Maybe suppose there's only one exception. This might be a likely place to look for it, <laughs> right? That I have an idea of myself that's not derived from any impression, right? Like what idea could, you know, the mind so to speak, have in its own nature without having to get a copy of something. So, um, and then why, what would that allow for? Maybe something I'm not getting in these two paragraphs. Because like I said, the first paragraph definitely seems to be talking about someone who says, I know I have a continuous, absolutely identical, um, simple self, because I perceive it every moment. So what they're directly asserting is they have the impression. But then it looks like we're attacking someone who says they have the idea. It doesn't claim they have the impression. And then we say there could be no such idea because there's no such impression. And I guess the point being that if there were such an idea, you wouldn't need the necessarily need the impression to see its relation to other ideas. Um, so in other words, maybe you could carry out Descartes' argument, something like that. But since there's no idea, because there's no impression, there's no way of doing that. 
Yeah. Um, I, I'm starting to feel like we're moving a little bit away from like the Carmito argument, but at the same oh, time, sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just arguing. Um, Wait, is that the, these are two different, these are two different words. Uh, sorry, I'm going to write down my last okay. Yeah. Words. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I was wondering what exactly was Hume's uh, contradiction based on its unfavorable sort of uh, interpretation of it. Like, was it that you can't have like an impression of yourself and that it's not true? Well, that's what, I, that's what I'm worrying about. What exactly okay. the objection is, and to what to what exactly it's an objection, right? And it's I, and I'm, I'm confused by it because again, like it sounds like in the first paragraph, he's objecting to the view that we have the impression. But then when he starts to, to make his argument, he seems to be arguing against the view that we have the idea, but not the impression. Uh, and says that's impossible. There would have to be an impression, and there's no such impression. Therefore, there's no idea. So, um, and like I said, that that first view that I know I exist because I have a constant impression, um, I, like I don't know whose view that's supposed to be. The second view sounds like the way I interpret Descartes. But, um, but then the first paragraph is weird. And then there's also the, the issue I was raising, which is um, what if Descartes says, you're right, Hume, in general, ideas have to be gotten from impression. But not this one. This one's innate, right? Like how... Uh, would that even be surprising if this were the exception? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, um, That somehow or other we land up, we, we end up with the question, what is the impression from which this idea is derived? And then Hume says um, that when we try to answer that question, we end up in a manifest contradiction and absurdity. Um, What is the contradiction? <laughs> because just thinking that some, something something's true when it's false is not a contradiction. I mean, that it's just thinking that something is true when in fact it's false <laughs> is not a contradiction. You have to think it's both true and false for it to be a contradiction, right? So, uh, like, um, so I mean. On the one hand, it's false that there is some impression that continues invariably the same throughout the whole of our lives. Um, right? At least Hume says, I don't have one. Maybe you do. <laughs> hey, but he doesn't seem to take that possibility seriously. Right? Like officially, it's, well, you know. Maybe some people have this continuing impression throughout their own lives, but then he says something like, but it, you know, leaving aside metaphysicians of this kind, <laughs> the rest of us, <laughs> and I, I think he's clearly implying that they don't have it either, right? You know, so, like why we should think that is, is, is a good question, but it's one that you might have an answer to. But in any case, so he says, like, there is no such impression. And he says, I would certainly know if I had it because it would be present at every point in my life. And I don't, right? So um, there's no such impression and therefore there's no such idea. Um,
But so far, that's not a contradiction. That's just a problem. So I think the contradiction is we get involved in is that because there's no such impression, um, what I actually think of when I think of myself is just uh, um, like pain of varying impressions and ideas, right? Constantly varying. Like that's the that's the sense that I really attach to my work self. The idea derived from this. And the contradiction is that um, uh, like it's derived from this impression that's constantly changing. And yet it, I maintain that it's the idea of something simple, indivisible, um, you know, continuous uh, and uh, absolutely identical. So then I'm contradicting myself. I mean, like this is very much like the contradiction we get into when, you know, when we try to think that these are the same impression because they resemble each other. But then we notice that they're different. <laughs> or like when we try to think that the small oak tree at one time and the big oak tree at another time are the same because the mind moves easily from one to the other. But then when we compare the two ends, we say that they're not the same, and it's a contradiction. So I think that's just the same contradiction here. Um, right? So, and therefore, the same thing, I mean, to draw a closer analogy, what's happening to us here is the same thing that happened to the ancient philosophers um, when. Uh, um, when they came up with the theory of substance in general. The same thing is, it's just the same thing happening when I regard myself as a substance. Um, um, you know, there's a relation between my perception, between my ideas and impressions. Well, there's, there's many relations. Between. They resemble each other. Or they, there's, there's relations of cause and effect. There's contiguity in, in time, right? So for all kinds of reasons, when I remember the course of my own previous perceptions, my, my mind moves easily along the sequence. He says the resemblance is especially strong because so many of these are memories. And, and memories necessarily resemble what they were memories of. I think this is a different way of thinking of memory than Locke does, actually. Where Locke thinks that the memory kind of like somehow, if it's a memory of an external object, this object is, is the thing in the past. Not, it's not, it doesn't present itself as an image of my perception of the thing in the past, but never mind that. So this is right. So, it's, so there's a lot of resemblance to this because we keep remembering the same things over and over. Um, so the mind protect path is particularly easy down here, and so we confuse it with identity. And then, just as in the usual case of like corporeal substances, we invent some uh, mysterious thing that you know. Because when we look back at the different parts, we notice that they're not identical, and so we invent some other thing that is identical. That these are like the modes or accidents of. Yeah. So are you saying like, yeah, it's like we're kind of weak. He, so Hume's saying that like we're just a bunch of like memories and impressions, perceptions that we, and we've like have been invented kind of like souls or something to like think of like ourselves. Yeah, we've, we've invented it to get out of this contradiction. Of thinking that this is one identical thing when it manifestly is not. So in order to get out of that contradiction, we invented something else that is always the same. And we call that the self. Um, or mind or soul. Yeah. In that way, is how, how, how would you say that relates to like Hume's idea of empiricism? Because like us being just a culmination of like a bunch of memories and perceptions, just like all these things, seems like it's like entirely from experience. All that. 
I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but I mean, uh, it's true, for example, that, you know, I mean, he doesn't think it's impossible that there would be one simple thing that would continue throughout, right? Uh, simple, indivisible, unchanging, and therefore really not even at different times, which is simultaneous with all of them. He doesn't think that's impossible. We just know from experience that there isn't. Um, so, uh, I mean, like, if there were such a thing, would it, would it do what these philosophers want? I mean, it would probably not, right? Like, it wouldn't really be a soul, it would just be like a sound that you always hear or something. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, um, but in any case, there isn't one, and we, and we only know that from experience. Um, So, um, so really, what he's saying about the intellectual world, the the mental world, the in, internal world, is pretty much the same as what he's saying about the external world. What there really is is like just one thing after another. They're, they they often resemble each other or are related in some other way, but they're different. They're not the same thing, um, and. There's uh, the internet, some new principle that's supposed to be the simple continuing thing that they're all modes of. Um, and apparently, the advantage of this intellectual world over the sensible world is supposed to be that in the case of the sensible world, I'm unable to reject the fiction. Right, like in one way or another, either in the extravagant way of the ancient philosophers or in the simpler way of the modern philosophers, but in one way or other, I'm like, um, uh, maybe that's not the right way to say it. No, maybe I should say it this way. This, this again, this is like, this is what looks most closely like what the ancient philosophers think. Right, the reason this is the same, they say, is that there's one, there's not perhaps a soul, right? A vegetable soul, a content, or a ceiling, a nutritive soul. So, um, and the sense in which it's always the same, even though its size and color and everything else changes, is that that soul, that substantial form, is always, you know, like indivisible and unchanging and absolutely identical to itself. So, um, um, so in both cases, this is a mistake caused by a confusion. In this case, we try to eliminate the mistake, and we end up in the modern philosophy. And the modern philosophy um, gets a good new contradiction. Right? So we say, no, no, there's no such thing as substantial forms. All there are are bodies with size, figure, motion, whatever. Um, uh, but it turns out that we aren't thinking about anything. So, in the case of the material world, um, you know, we started with the view of the vulgar, but that was evidently false. So, we ended up in the ancient philosophy, and we realized there was something wrong with the ancient philosophy. So, we ended up in the modern philosophy, but the modern philosophy is, is incoherent. So, supposedly, the advantage of the intellectual world is going to be that in this case, we can just get rid of this fiction and not land in a new contradiction. Um, um, So this, that's what he says actually at the beginning of section five. Right, having found such, this is on page two, uh, 
bottom of page 280. Having found such contradictions and difficulties in every system concerning external objects and in the idea of matter, which we fancy so clear and determinate, we shall naturally expect so great a difficulties and contradictions in every hypothesis concerning our internal perceptions. But then he says, the intellectual world, though involved in infinite obscurities, is not perplexed with any such contradictions as those we have discovered in the natural. Right, so that's supposed to be what happens. But then in the appendix, um, he says, unfortunately, this was one thing I was mistaken about. So this in the Penguin book is on page 675. I had, I had entertained some hopes that however deficient our theory of the intellectual world might be, it would be free from those contradictions and absurdities which seem to attend every explication that human reason can give of the material world. So that's what he says, that's what I had hoped when I wrote the main body of the text. But now, at this later time when I'm writing the appendix, um, um, upon a more strict review of the section concerning personal identity, I find myself involved in such a labyrinth that I must confess I neither know how to correct my former opinions nor how to render them consistent. Um, and then he goes on to say, um, as I understand it, he goes on to say, but that's okay because this is just one more good group for skepticism. <laughs> but um, um, the problem is in this passage in the appendix, it's really not clear exactly what the problem is that he ran into. Um, I mean, he spends most of the passage about it in the appendix going over his old. Um, right, and he you know ends up saying we only feel a connection or determination of the thought to pass from sorry we only feel a connection or determination of the thought to pass from one object to another. It follows therefore that the thought alone finds personal identity when reflecting on the train of past perceptions that compose the mind. Um, follows therefore. Let me understand the syntax of the science. Follows therefore that the thought alone finds personal identity when reflecting on the train of past perceptions that compose the mind. Maybe there's supposed to be a comma after when? When, reflecting on the train of past perceptions that compose the mind, the ideas of them are felt to be connected together and naturally introduce each other. Right, I think that's what it means. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's his old view, right? And then he says, but all my hopes vanish when I come to explain the principles that unite our successive perceptions in our thought or consciousness. I cannot discover any theory which gives me satisfaction on this head. Um, and then in the next paragraph, he says something that sounds just like a summary of the position he therefore lands at lands. At. So like he doesn't say what are the things he tried and why they didn't work. Um, now, like, I used to think that the problem must be something kind of deep about self-consciousness or something. And there would be something like um, what uh, 
some point, like like whatever point is made in Kant's resolution of this problem, transcendental unity of our perception, whatever. Like Kant agrees, we don't have an intuition of our self as a, as a intellectual being, but you know, then he goes on to explain what like what we do have. It's called the transcendental unity of our perception. So, um, um, and it's based on. Um, Well, this, this is the transcendental reduction, so no one agrees what it's based on. But I'm going to say, you know, it's based on the fact that in order to have a general idea, I must represent myself as possibly having the same idea or concept as Kant says at another time with a different object. Um, and that means I have to represent, have to be able to represent myself somehow as continuing in time. Um, and that ends up being the source of all my knowledge of necessity, right? So, like, I used to think something like that. I I do think, although again, it's not clear that Kant was directly familiar with anything in the treatise. He certainly knew some things about what it said in the treatise. Um, I, I'm sure he heard that you ended up in a prediction here, and you know, so like. I, I think Kant thinks he's confronting the problem that Hume is confronting. But what Hume actually said about the problem, which I read again, all my hopes vanish when I come to explain the principles that unite our successive perceptions in thought and consciousness. Um, it sounds like the problem is pretty simple, right? It sounds like the problem is what is the relation that makes the minds? pass easily through this theory. Um, but then, why is it so hard to find them? I mean, you said before what all the relations are. So I'm not sure, but the one thing I can think of, and this would be related to Kant somehow, not as directly as what I was thinking before, but like, so again, this is the way he thinks of memory. There was an impression here, and then there was a resembling idea here. So what makes this one a memory of this Um, because, like, after all, in someone in someone else's mind, we'd have a resembling impression, but this wouldn't be a memory. Of this. So, um, it seems like there must be some way that this. Is this idea is necessarily related to this impression. There must be some um, connection between them. And I have to know that first before I can notice the resemblance that makes my mind pass easily over these. Because I have to be able to put them in this series and you know and leave this one out. <laughs> Um, so, uh, like, this mind could have something that's just like my memory of this whole series. Um, but, which in this mind is a fantasy. So, um, um, what makes the one in my mind a memory of the whole series such that the fact that my mind can pass easily through it makes me, um, I'm not sure actually if that's the right way to do judgment. You know, if I, if I have to bring, I don't know if I have to bring that in, but in any case, like that it's something in that neighborhood 
that it's so that it's like we're asking um, what it is that makes these members in the same series in the first place. And it seems like we have to have that in place before we can notice those other principles like cause and effect and resemblance, etc. Um, but then Hume says that that's impossible, right? So that so what he says in the end is, in short, there are two principles which I cannot render consistent, nor is it in my power to renounce either of them, to wit, that all our distinct perceptions are distinct existences, and that the mind never perceives any real connection among distinct existences. Because again, the mind needs to perceive a real connection between perceptions in order to get started on the experiment where it starts to believe um, that there's something identical. Um, um, okay, so that's all I have to say about the main discussion of personal identity. Are there questions about that? Because I'm going to mention something else about personal identity. Okay. So, uh, because uh, Hume actually, um, when he starts discussing principal identity, not quite, it's not exactly at the start, so page 301. In order to answer this question, we must distinguish betwixt personal identity as it regards our thought or imagination and as it regards our passions or the concern we take in ourselves. The first is our present subject. Right, so he's basically making a distinction, I think, between what we call theoretical personal identity and practical personal identity. Um, right, there's a personal. Um, There's the discussion here, which is about like um, why we think or imagine ourselves to be one thing. And then there's another question which would be about our passions or our concern for ourselves. And um, what would that other question be? Um, so I think he says what it would be in page 309. Um, um, Maybe where I said this. Oh, okay, I guess it is. And in this view, our identity with regard to the passions serves to corroborate that with regard to the imagination by the making our distant perceptions influence each other and by giving us a present concern for our past or future pains or pleasures. Right? So the question about practical identity would be because he's not discussing here. <laughs> would be what makes us have a present concern for our past or future pains or pleasures, right? Like what makes me, um, I don't want future self to be in pain because it's me. That's personal identity, right? But it's practical personal identity. It's not like because I um, believe in the existence of some simple indivisible thing. Um, 
It's because I take a concern in that future person. Um, so this is basically, this one is personal identity and locks. Ray, remember Locke said that, that the issue about, you know, the question about whether I'm the same substance or the same animal or whatever is, um, might be interesting for some person, purposes, but it's not personal identity because Locke said person is a forensic concept, right? So like person, the same person as me is the person whose um, future reward or punishment concerns me now. And so it makes sense to hold them responsible for what I do, because in that way I can be deterred from doing it by the by the pain that they're going to suffer, or or, or, by, or or induced to do it by the pleasure they're going to get. Um. So um. So Hume, you know, Hume says, I'm not. I'm only going to talk about this one here. Um, is there somewhere where he talks about this one? Well, so in this case, I did follow the editor's footnote and they sent me to a place in book two and but I don't think he talks about it there either. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure if he ever comes back to this and explains it. Um, Now, Locke seems to think that memory, which um, plays such an important role in the answer to this question, according to Hume, that memory can be sufficient to account for this. Um, that um, the fact that a certain future person or person, certain future human being is going to remember being me is somehow sufficient for me to care about their pains and pleasures. Um, I kind of glossed that over when we talked about Locke um, because um, it's not clear how it's supposed to work, right? Like why should I be in particular motivated to avoid pain in the future, specifically in someone who remembers being me? What difference does that make? I think, you know, it would make more sense if you thought of punishment not as deterrent, but as retribution, right? Like if you thought of the point of punishment was to make me regret my past actions, um, then that would clearly be the relevant issue. Do I, re do I remember being the person who did those actions? Otherwise, I can't regret them. Um, but of course, that's not Locke's view, view of punishment. Um, 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 so, like, this is, I think, this remains kind of mysterious what accounts for this. Um, and yet, um, it turns out that, so uh, remember when I started reading that, um, and in this view, our identity with regard to the passion serves to corroborate that with regard to the imagination. So what Hume, so Hume doesn't account for this here, but what he does do is say, and because we have that, this, that also serves to strengthen this. It corroborates it. Um, and, um, when, you know, when we get to the answer with respect to this, it turns, it kind of looks like this corroboration might be pretty important. <laughs> um, um, so, I say we get to the answer. It's actually the rest that we're going to read is before the one I just read, the same paragraph. But in the way I'm organizing it, when we get to the answer to this, it looks like the answer to this might be really 
important to backing up the answer to this. Um, he says, in this respect, I cannot compare the soul more properly to anything than to a republic or commonwealth in which the several members are united by the reciprocal ties of government and subordination. Right, so what really makes us um, um, believe in personal identity, he says, it's not just those relations of resemblance and causation. Um, because, you know, those on themselves, in themselves in general, give rise to only like a weak idea of identity. Right, like if, you know, um, if you imagine a rock that's kind of being worn away by erosion or something. Um, so yeah, you kind of tend to think of it as the same rock. But um, I guess, at least according to Hume, and this seems kind of right, that if someone says, well, it's not really the same rock, you know, it's a little bit left of the original rock or something like that, I just say, yeah, yeah, whatever. You don't, you don't have this strong temptation to invent some simple thing that continues through this process and say that was really the rock and it just changed its size. I think, like, even according to Aristotelians, when you talk about this kind of homeomorous body, right, the, uh, body all of whose parts, I mean, a rock isn't really like that, but like, assume it's pure elemental water. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we don't think water is an element, but they thought water was an element, right? So assume it's pure elemental water. Um, so every part of it is the same as every other part, that's a homeomorous body. Um, you know, I think Aristotelians, I mean, they, they, they think it has a substantial form, but they don't think the substantial form serves to like split it into individuals, the way it happens with animals and plants. So you can't really, you know, like if this glob of water splits into two globs of water, these both have the substantial form of water. You can't ask, like, you know, which one did this substantial form go into, or something like that. Um, right. So, um, so where do we really have a strong tendency to do this? And he says, well, it's where the different stages are united by a common purpose, or you know, like they work together to a common end. You know. So he mentioned the. The ship that where like its parts are constantly replaced, and at the end it doesn't have any of the parts it had before. But um, but all those various parts were all united in the common purpose of what you need that ship to do, right? And similarly, in the oak tree case, it says like the oak seems to be throughout its life trying to grow itself, and you know, right? So um, so like that's what lends real strength to that idea that there's something simple and indivisible there. And it looks like in the case of the self, that only comes from the tactical self, I think. So this is both um, seems important. I mean, it's, it's according to Locke, it's the whole subject of personal identity. According to Hume, it's a different question of personal identity, but it seems actually like it's really important also to the one he's talking about. And um, perhaps neither of them have a really strong uh, explanation of why it occurs. Okay. Um, I think that's everything about personal identity. Um, I mean, maybe I actually will have time to talk about section seven, but are there questions? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> So does, does he not really think a rock has a theoretical um, uh, personal identity? Well, okay. Well, I mean, so the rock, presumably the rock doesn't have impressions and ideas in it all. Right? So it doesn't have, like, um, it doesn't think of itself as simple and continuous or think of anything else. Right. Um, so yes, the rock doesn't have, but, but that's not what we're talking about here. 
what we're talking about is like our temptation to us uh, to invent something identical that like underlies the whole change, the whole process of change. And he's saying, in the case of the rock, now like, so he thinks that, except for the contradiction he gets into later in the appendix, in the body of the text, he thinks that's always just an unjustified fiction, right? So there is no such simple thing in the rock or in the tree or in myself, right? They're all just invented. So, I mean, what he thinks is different about the case of the rock is only that our temptation to invent that thing is weaker. So, right, so you say, does he just think the rock doesn't have theoretical identity? Well, he doesn't think anything really has theoretical identity, except things that are really identical, that is, um, like, impressions that don't change. <laughs> while other ones do or something like that but um yeah so he doesn't think any changing thing really has theoretical identity but uh he thinks in the case of the rock we have less tendency to to imagine that it that it does okay so it's just like more probable that a like an identical impression would be uh that we would, we would have like identical impressions of the same rock over time like they're, they're like therefore like a practical identity. No, I'm not sure. Actually, okay, I, I think I've got to get across by what the what the design is. But so the so first of all, like the, this distinction is about self is about personal identity, about self identity, right? It's because in the case of myself, there's two different points of view from which. I can ask the question whether I'm the same as myself or not. What is this theoretical question? Is there something that's always the same? The other is this practical question, like, is this future person someone I could care about in the same way I care about my present self? Those are the two. So like neither of those questions, well, like, so the practical question doesn't come up with respect to the rock. Right? Uh, the, so, something like the theoretical question comes up with respect to the rock if I start to think that there's some simple thing that is the rock, the real rock, and these are just changing stages or something. So if I start to think that, then that's analogous to the theoretical identity. We have to explain why I start to think that because it's evidently false, <laughs> according to you, right? There isn't anything simple and that, that, that endures through this process. There's a complex thing, a rock, and some of its parts move away, and other parts stay, and that's the whole story. Right? So there isn't something simple and identical, but, but like if I were tempted to, if I started to think there was, then Hume would try to explain that. And he would try to explain that by say, by talking about the relations of resemblance and cause and effect and contiguity that there are between these different rocks. Um, so, but he says in the case of the rock, it's just, um, um, I don't tend to invent that thing as much. And he says the reason I don't tend to invent that thing as much is because in the case of the rock, all there are are these relations of resemblance and cause and effect and whatever. Whereas in the case of the tree, or the case of the ship, um, Right, or like all the pieces have changed. <laughs> right, so in these cases, in addition to the fact that it gradually changes and it resembles itself and so on and so forth, there's also this unity of purpose that it seems at least like it's trying to do one thing throughout the whole process. And similarly, in the ship, it seems like this, you know, this is all part of the same voyage. <laughs> so, or trying to get somewhere. And, you know, um, so in these cases, it's an additional reason for the mind to pass easily from one stage to the next. Because besides just resembling each other and whatever, they also, like, they have, there's a constant purpose that we focus on as we go through them that makes it easier to connect them. And so in these cases, there's a stronger tendency 
to invent that simple thing and to say, you know, well, all the work may have changed, but the chip itself is still there. Or uh, even more so in the case of the tree, you know, well, all those molecules may have changed and the shape and the size and color may have changed, but the tree itself, it's substantial form, you know, it's, it's soul has remained constant throughout. That's what we're tempted to say in this case. I guess, in this case, I mean, do we really think that in this case? Well, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's what we're tempted to think in this case. Um, in both cases, it's false, but just in this case, the temptation is stronger, and Hume thinks he can explain why it's stronger in this case. Did, is there still something confusing about this? Because Yeah, maybe you have a question. Yeah, it's just like you're saying that like of theoretical and practical. Theoretical is the constant regular like form of the soul and all that. And practical is I might have done the backwards, but practical is the one that is like always changing and uh, okay. well they're both about regarding something as the same even though it's always changing. Because <laughs> okay. that's because they're both about identity. Yeah, um, that's what identity is. You know, they're they're both about regarding something as a, as the same, even though it's always changing. It's just like remember. I know I said this at the beginning of the course. Maybe I haven't said it for a while. Like, what's the difference between theoretical and practical? Is, right? Like a theoretical question is a question about like what is what is true. Um, a practical question is a question about what should I do. Right. So like. Practical philosophy is ethics and politics. Theoretical philosophy is like metaphysics and epistemology. Right. It's Aristotle's terminology. Um, uh, these early modern people use it sometimes. Hume doesn't use it here. And then like Kant uses it again in a big way. So like, right. So so like I said, Hume doesn't use this that terminology here, but that is a way of explaining quickly, but maybe it's not a good way. Explaining quickly the difference between the two problems he's talking about. Right? One is a problem is like, uh, is there something identical and what is it? What's it like in me? That's a theoretical question, right? I'm trying to know something more about the world. A practical question is a question about what, sh what should I do, right? And so here the question is like, should I avoid pain to this future individual? In some in some cases the answer seems to be yes, and in other cases seems to be no. I mean, like assuming like assuming I'm looking out for myself here at the beginning, right? So I, if I'm if I'm looking out for myself, should I avoid pain to this future individual or to this individual or first year individual or to none of them? Um so, like, it might depend on whether there's some simple thing that exists in me and in them, but it's like you would have to explain why that's relevant. <laughs> it might depend, as Locke says, on whether that future thing remembers being me, but you have to explain why that's relevant. Um, but in any case, the question you're asking is not does it remember being me or does it have something simple? It, it, in common with me, the question you're asking is, should I care about what happens? The practical question. So there really are two different questions. However, Hume says that because, but he doesn't explain why, but he says because we um, we feel we have an answer to the practical question. We care about what happened to a certain person in the past and what will happen to them in the future. Like what happened to certain individuals in the past and certain individuals in the future, the same way we care about what happens to ourselves now. Um, therefore, we regard that whole series of humans as related by a common purpose, right? Like we're all in it together. All my past and future selves and me are all in it together because they care about my pain and pleasure and I care about their pain and pleasure, right? So so it's very much like the ship or the oak tree, 
that there seems to be like a common purpose that ties these different stages together. And then Hume says, like that unity. He doesn't again, he doesn't explain where that comes from. But that way of regarding all those stages as all in it together then strengthens our tendency to think that there's some one simple thing mm -hmm. so to answer the theoretical question on certain things. Does, does that? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to start talking about the conclusion for book one. Um, So it's so first of all, a lot of weird things happen in this section really quickly. Um, um, in at least throughout a big part of the section, there's an elaborate dramatic fiction. Right now, I, mean, I remember. I remember I mentioned already like some instances of something like this in the earlier parts of this book, um, where again, where Hume writes as if um, as if we're listening to a real time description of his thoughts and feelings. Um, like, and then it's a fiction because, of course, we're not. <laughs> like, maybe he actually went through this sequence of thoughts and feelings at some point, but he doesn't go through it every time someone reads this book. <laughs> He's not even around it, right? So, um, so, uh, and well, I guess more to the point, he didn't go through it as he was writing the book, and then just like when he finished his sequence of feelings and thoughts, sent it off to the publisher. He obviously, this is obviously very carefully written. This is just like Descartes' meditation, it's similar to Descartes' meditation. Right? Like he says, you know, the meditator character in the meditations, like, says, well, for a long time I've wanted to doubt all my old beliefs, so now I'm going to try now, but like, okay, how about this? How about this? And then, oh no, now I feel so confused. I think I better sleep on it and work on it tomorrow. And, Right. And like, so like, it, again, it sounds like you're like, it sounds like Descartes, you know, kept a really careful diary for, for a couple of days while he had all these thoughts and then like sent it off to the publisher and that's what you're getting. But of course, that's not true. Right. Of course, he, you know, whether or not he had some deep sequence of thoughts like this at some time, it, like, first of all, the, the nature of the genre of the work is not such that it even really claims that, right? I mean, it's a fiction. Like if Descartes never sat in a room by the fire with a lump of wax and whatever, it wouldn't make the meditations false. So, um, so, so this, like, so there's a lot of places like that in Hume. They're not as clearly marked off, right? But, but this one is particularly elaborate. Um, and um, but instead of going through a um, series of arguments, this narrator goes through a series of um, uh, well, through a series of why is my notes getting really complicated? Go through a series of emotions, passions, um, actually like temperaments. Go through a series of temperaments. So, what are the temperaments? Um, so, temperament actually means mixture, right? Like temperare is like a mix. Like when you mix water and wine, right? So, um, but like in ancient medical theory, um, there was there are four humors in the body: um, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. And uh, 
the health of the body depends on having the right mixture of the humans, the right temperament. And in particular, like what we might call mental health depends on the temperament of the brain. I guess, and for the earlier people, it was the temperament in the heart, but uh, Galen discovered that the, the brain was the organ involved here. Um, basically because of like observing people who got brain injuries, <laughs> seeing what happened. Right, so, uh, right, so the, so the mixture of humors in the brain determines like what mood you're in, sort of, what, what your temperament is. Um, uh, so like this is the origin of, you know, well, first of all, one of the ways we use the word temperament now, but also like a temper, a temper tantrum, right? It's also the, the origin of the word temperature because temperature was supposed to be the mixture in the air of, you know, uh, different elements. Um, so, right, so like whether Hume believes in this humoral theory of medicine or not, I'm not sure. Um, I, I feel like he probably doesn't, but um, right, but he's but he's using it as a metaphor here, right? So like the first, um, the first stage is melancholy and delirium. So melancholy is the temperament, right? Melancholy actually means black bile. It's the name of one of the four humors. <laughs> um, so like melancholy is the case when you have too much black bile in the mixture that's in your brain, <laughs> right? And then the second one is the stage of spleen and indolence. Spleen, they, so I guess they used to think that yellow bile is produced in the spleen, right? I mean, there really is no such thing as black bile and yellow bile. There is such a thing as bile, but there's really no such thing as black bile. There is such a thing as blood and phlegm, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, so they used to think that yellow bile is produced in the spleen. So like this means that you have too much yellow bile and that's supposed to make you, uh, um, Another word for this is cholera. Right? This makes you kind of melancholic, right? <laughs> like depressed or something. This makes you choleric, which still means like angry. Tending to get angry, and which is also what spleen can mean. Uh, so that's the second temperament. And then the third temperament is. Um, serious good humor. Oh no, good humor and seriousness. Good humor and seriousness. And I'm not sure whether by good humor he means like um, that blood per, per, like predominates in your temperament. So that would be what's called a sanguine temperament, um, right? Which makes you like happy and confident. Um, or if by like, good humor, he means uh, like a balance where, right, where none of the humors, like the health balance. Um, it, it actually, it makes a difference which he means to understand how the story comes out. <laughs> um, I'm not sure which he means. Um, phlegm is not mentioned here. So he does talk about phlegm in some other places. Yeah. Um, could we compare the second temperament to like something like adrenaline? Yeah, no, adrenaline doesn't really make you angry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like I said, the truth is, this is not how the body works, right? I mean, there aren't more humors and whatever. Um, 
Uh, but it's an ancient and widespread theory. I mean, I think ancient Chinese medicine has some uh, version of this also. Um, so, uh, and like I said, I don't, I don't think that Hume is. I should find this out once and for all someday. Like, what Hume probably would have thought about this theory. Um, uh, exactly when you know people stop believing in that, right? But I don't think you is like seriously proposing. He's like he's um, he's using this to establish a medical metaphor for what happens. Uh, right. So it doesn't really matter for medicine. Um, it's like a question of how, like, a certain kind of imbalance can cause a, uh, a wrong mood. And what can be expected to cure that? Um, so, um, and I guess, like, so in the case of the meditations, I think it's pretty clear we're supposed to identify with the medical, with the character. I mean, I think that's pretty clear, even though people usually don't. They usually think of that character as Descartes. <laughs> but I think you're supposed to think of that the character as you when you're reading it, right? Like that character is holding a paper and reading it, not writing <laughs> in the meditation. But in any case, be that as it may, um, like, you know, so are we supposed to identify with this kind of anti meditator character, <laughs> unmeditated? Um, so, like, what does identify with mean? Means like we pretend we're the same as them. Right? Like we feign an identity with them. And I think Hume would say that means that we like feign that their pains and pleasures affect us. Um, so, like Bill Clinton used to say, I feel your pain. Right? That's <laughs> it. Um, so, um, so this is actually like what's going on here is somehow close to whatever it is that establishes that practical self identity. Um, but it's but it's like artificially being generated with a a series of patterns that perhaps no one has ever had. It's, it's a fiction. Um, so, um, so if so, like, it's kind of strange, but, and I mean, I guess I should say, like, what are these stages? <laughs> So the stage of melancholy and delirium, and by the way, I'm not sure what series delirium, indolence, and seriousness combined to. It seems like to be able to gather those together too, but I don't know. Right? Indolence means like laziness. Right? So, um, but the stages are like he says, well, um, you know, uh, now that I've after having finished written book one, writing book one, um, I find myself in a state where, like, um, I can't believe anything that normal people believe, and um, I feel myself expelled from the human race, um, and I'm just like, uh, I don't know what to think anymore, and I'm sunk into this state of melancholy and delirium. And he says, reason can't cure this. 
um, right? Like arguments won't get me out of it. Uh, and of course, this is no state to be in to begin right to right with two. Because um, you don't want to do anything in this state, right? So, um, uh, so what is going to cure? We're like in suspense. Will there be a book two or not? <laughs> and he says, well, the only thing that cures it is time. Time and doing something else. Right, like says, I dine. I I play a game of backgammon. <laughs> hey, like um, he does all kinds of normal stuff, and after a while, um, uh, after he's distracted himself enough from the doubts and you know and um, contradictions and everything that he was involved in, he says, you know, when I return to this is on page three sixteen. When I would return to these speculations. They appear cold, strained, and ridiculous. Seems like writer's block. Well, no, it's not writer's block. It's so it's um, it doesn't affect me anymore, right? Like I mean, remember actually, I think the discussion of this starts by saying, um, um, like. He, 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 he brings back again, or he recalls the argument that what prevents us from reducing all our, our beliefs to zero probability, or I mean, to, um, to like zero certainty, is just that very fine and complex reasoning have little, has little effect on the mind. Right, remember that, that was the, that was the solution in part one of, of, of Sorry, in section one of part four. <laughs> so, uh, um, but he says, but what am I now saying? <laughs> that these, that these refined reasonings have no effect on the mind. On the contrary, they're having a huge effect on me. I don't know what to think. <laughs> All right, right. So, um, so what happens at, after he plays backgammon and has dinner is that he comes back and looks at the reasonings. He doesn't find anything wrong with them, but they don't affect him anymore. Um, you know, before he was like, what am I supposed to believe now? I can't believe this, I can't believe that. He comes back to them and he's like, I believe what I always believe. These reasonings are cold, strange, and ridiculous. <laughs> so that's the end of it. Right, like he says, you know what? Like, I don't care about these things. Um, much the same, you might think that way you might feel at the end of the corner. <laughs> like, so, um, so, and the spleen comes because he says, but well, I remember enough of how bad the state was that I'm angry. And I want to throw my all my papers in the fire. <laughs> right? I resolve never to get involved in this trap again. <laughs> um, I had a roommate in grad school who said that at one time he was very interested in philosophy. And by the way, he was one of the people um, I've known who was most clearly smarter than I am. <laughs> anyway, so like. And he was he was studying computer science, right? So he said, like, at some time in the past, I was really interested in philosophy, but then I realized that I'm happier if I don't think about it. <laughs> right? So that's the mood that Hume is in now, except a little stronger than that, right? He's like, ah, out with this stuff. <laughs> um, so again, we're like in more suspense. Is book two going to get written? Is book one going to get thrown in the fire? <laughs> Right, you can see it's a, it's a fiction, right? We know book one wasn't thrown in the fire. <laughs> we know book two was written because we're holding the book, right? But so, so like, what's going to cure this? And he says, again, arguments aren't going to clear cure this, right? Like, philosophy isn't going to be able to come back and explain to me why, no, it is a good idea to engage in these refined reasonings. 
or whatever. He says, again, it's just time. After a while, I get bored of fat gammon and, and eating and whatever, and I start to think about philosophy again. And that's when I return to this state of good humor and seriousness. And then I'm like, uh, yeah, let's make some more refined arguments. <laughs> And now we know book two is going to get written, right? <laughs> um, uh, and he says, like, that's all that philosophy can produce on its behalf. Um, so, like, in particular, if you're one of those people who, um, this would not describe my former roommate. But if you're one of those people who just uh, is an honest gentleman who spends all their time involved in their business or in uh, common leisure pursuits and never is bothered by philosophy, he says, like, far be it for me to suggest that you should take up philosophy. <laughs> but, you know, if you find that you want to think about philosophy, don't be like, um, oh no, I can't because I resolved not to when I was in my mood of clean and indolence, right? He says, like, the true skepticism is to, uh, you know, uh, follow out our arguments as far as is pleasant. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you feel like doing it, uh, don't think that there's some proof that, that you should because there won't be a proof. That's the skepticism. Um, this is probably somehow related to the fact that, as I think I mentioned before, that when he wrote a short autobiography of himself, like before he died, it was mostly about how much his book sold. <laughs> Like you know, and like one of the things he mentions in this good humor and seriousness is that you know, I mean, I was saying I, I feel like doing some more refined reasoning, but it's more than that. He thinks about how the learned world is in a bad state, he wants to help it out, he's ambitious to make a name for himself, and presumably he also thinks about how much the book might sell. <laughs> so he was disappointed when the book fell still weren't in the press, but um. Um, now, like, like I said, this how we understand this story may depend a lot on whether this is whether all these three of these are forms of madness, right? or whether this one is the state of health. And as I said, I'm, I, I'm ambiguous because because good humor could mean that you sort of you have too much of a good humor. Or it could mean you have the right temperament, you know, the right mixture. Um, but I just want to point out one more thing, which is that um, this is closer to the plot of the meditations than you might think. <laughs> right? I mean, like, there's a doubt. This would be the end of the first meditation. But the doubt, I don't know what to do. I feel expelled from the world. I don't know what to think. Um, uh, as Descartes says, I am like a prisoner who is enjoying an imaginary freedom while asleep. Doesn't make a good translation. When later he begins to suspect that he is dreaming, he dreads being woken up and goes along with the pleasant illusion as long as he can. In the same way, I happily slide back into my old opinions and dread being shaken out of them for fear that my peaceful sleep may be followed by hard labor when I wake and I shall have to toil not in the light but amid the inextricable darkness of the problems I have now raised. Right? So at the end of the first meditation, I find myself in this state and I like kind of willingly fall back into a state of indolence. Um, 
And then in the beginning of the second meditation, somehow my doubts are resolved. And I'm able to go on. Um, this is a kind of answer to the meditations here, I think. But Hume is saying that, again, that this is a sickness that reason isn't going to help you with. But that's Descartes' mistake. But the only thing that will help with this is awaiting the change of your temperament. Okay, that's all I have time for. So I'll see you next week. Perfect.